Hello and welcome. Uh, thank you to everyone watching live or in person for come and thank you for coming to the Women's Project, illuminating the legacy of slavery in Rhode Island. August 23rd, which was the original date for this first performance, was the International Day for the Remembrance of the Transatlantic Slave Trade and its Abolition. We would like to commemorate that day with site-specific visual art light projections and live performances. The first taking place here today at University Hall on the Brown University campus in Providence, and two performances to follow. The second performance will take place August 30th in Woonsocket, where Frederick Douglass and abolitionist Abby Kelly convened an anti-slavery convention in 1841, and the third will take place on September 15th in Cranston, location to be announced. Through light projections and performance, we seek to build our collective memory of the history of slavery in Rhode Island and make connections to struggles for racial justice and equity today. Today, we seek to ensure that all Rhode Islanders understand their history and its impact on present day lives. It is only through understanding our past that we can fight for a better future. I would like to say a special thank you to scholar activist Marco McWilliams for his thoughtful and insightful contributions to the historical content of today's performance. I would also like to say thank you to writer, poet, and educator Marlon O'Carey for writing most of today's script, which will be performed by my best friend, Katia. And finally, I would like to thank visual artist Devin Brown for her beautiful, thought-provoking art today's performance, but, and I would also like to thank everyone who's here for holding up your cameras, it's awesome. Uh, today's performance would not be as special without you all and all of your help. Um, with that, I'm going to bring on my best friend, Katya. More Sugar by Marlon O. Carey. More sugar, more rum, more slaves. 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 We must first acknowledge that we are standing here on stolen land. The captured prisoners of the Pequot War in 1637, members of the Pequot, Narragansett, and Wampanoag clans were the first to be enslaved here. For the first 100 years, they were sold and traded as property. Way before the first enslaved Africans arrived in 1638, courtesy of William Pierce from Salem, Massachusetts who traded 17 Pequot captives in the West Indies for some cotton and tobacco and meat. See those ships sailing out of Newport and Providence off to the Western Cape of Africa to body snatch humans, usually between 200 and 600, human beings below decks in the cargo hold, and the average Rhode Islander in the 17th and 18th centuries were quite accustomed to buying a few shares in a slave voyage. It was no different to them than buying shares of a corporation is for us today. It was a high risk investment, but if successful, meaning the captains of these ships managed to capture or barter or kidnap men, women, children, and sold the strongest of them in the Caribbean into the labor on the sugar plantations in the islands of the West Indies, South America, and Cuba. They would receive a tidy profit. They Living and working conditions on the island plantations were horrendous, and the life expectancy was less than seven years. A constant supply of human cargo was needed in order to keep up with the demand for more, more sugar, more rum, more slaves. Roger Williams arrived in the colonies in 1631 from England. He had been a school teacher and a colorful preacher back in Britain, but about five years after he arrived, he was banished from Salem for his new and dangerous ideas. He was preaching about the oft heralded feature of the American system of government, the idea of separation of church and state. He wanted civic affairs to be outside the realm of the church. For instance, he disagreed with the right of the church to seize land from the Native Americans. The other leading Puritans plotted to abduct Williams and send him back to Britain. Hearing of this plot, Williams and several close followers fled to the wilderness, as the story goes, and found refuge here when he encountered a group of Narragansett nati natives, who instead of their worst fears, uttered the, uttered the phrase, what's your knee top? Which loosely translates to, what's the news, friend? Or what's up? Williams was the first, was the familiar with the native customs and languages. He would later publish the first dictionary in native languages in the US, 
was able to purchase land and start a colony with his followers. He welcomed all who desired freedom of conscience and the removal of church from civil affairs. The offer attracted many other dissatisfied Puritans. They came in droves, and Williams called it an act of God and named the place Providence. The colony would struggle even as it grew, but as it grew in size, it grew in power and influence. The actions of the individuals involved in the lively experiment of Rhode Island would send reverberations all over the colonies and affect all aspects of the burgeoning United States. The decisions of the parties involved would send shockwaves of consequences for generations to come, and we feel their effects in our society today. More sugar, more rum, more slaves, more money. More sugar, more rums, more slaves, more money. Everybody was in. Even Roger Williams from the very beginning was deep in it. He may have expressed his dislike for perpetual chattel slavery, but he throughout his life in the colonies was a mediator and negotiator for both the trade of enslaved natives and captured English prisoners of war. Trading natives from the south and relocated them to the north was a common practice. It was a way of preventing the captives from reassembling and bringing another fight. The relocated captives would not know the terrain of the land they would move to. They would not be provided with land so that they could farm and feed their families, which was the practice of the natives before the arrival of the colonists. The men were shipped away and the women and children were carted out as workers on all the various plantations and shops involved in outfitting the slave ships. Our entire economy was steeped in it. It is well recorded that the slave trade is woven into the very fabric of our state's DNA. The major export after the Revolutionary War as the practice of slavery continued in the antebellum South and illegally in places like Bristol was Negro cloth, a coarse and durable cheap cloth made to provide basic clothing for enslaved people. It was designed to separate this enslaved from the members of society. Rhode Island mills churned this cloth with cotton derived from plantations in the South, providing thousands of, thousands of yards of cloth for everything from Negro clothing to blankets and shoes, creating a sickening cycle of enslaving humans in order to make them work without pay in the endeavor of propping up and giving their entire energies to an enterprise that abused them and stripped them of their humanity. The life on the island plantations was horrendous and the life expectancy was less than seven years. A constant supply of human cargo was needed in order to keep up with the demand for more. More sugar, more rum, more slaves. At least 30 of the members of the original board that founded the College, the College of Rhode Island were slaveholders themselves, as well as rich merchants who depended heavily on the profits from the slave trade. One of the worst voyages ever was the slave ship Sally, which sailed for Africa from Providence in 1764, the same year when the College of Rhode Island, the original name of Brown University, was founded. It was a voyage funded by and organized by the Brown family, John Moses, Nicholas, and Joseph. All the brothers at one time worked in the family business, which though never entirely based in direct slave trade and voyages, was heavily involved with the provisioning of slave ships and their necessary details. The Sally was a huge disaster for the Brown brothers. It would lead three of the four, all except John, who chose to continue to support the voyages directly on his own, to leave the business of slave voyage sponsorship entirely. In particular, Moses Brown, who would make, t make a major turn to abolitionists later after his wife died. Of the 196 enslaved captives they managed to gather after an unusually long nine months on the coast of Africa, 109 of them died. Some were killed by sickness and disease because of the horrific conditions in the holding factories on the coast and, the, and in the belly of the ship. Others were shot when they tried to rebel and escape. One woman hung herself. The captain, Isaac Hopkins, brother of Stephen Hopkins, documented every death and every rebellion on the journey meticulously in a legend. He brought the slaves emaciated and near death to the market in the Caribbean. The seller there, after seeing the poor sales, the enslaved human cargo fetched a price that was one third of the expected going rate. The seller was inclined to remark that, should you return with better slaves, I can promise you satisfaction. The trip was insured by, by banks the Browns and others formed with proceeds, with proceeds from the involvement in the slave trade. 
They also formed insurance companies to cover them in case of their losses. Isaac Hopkins would later become the first commander in chief of the Navy. More slaves, more sugar, more rum, more slaves. More slaves, more sugar, more rum, more slaves. There were over 1,000 such slave voyages that departed from Rhode Island ports. This number is about half of the total number of voyages that sailed from the U.S. as part of the American slave trade. A trade Rhode Island dominated even as the founding fathers were crafting the Declaration of Independence. John Brown was one of the most vocal about his defense of the business of slavery. He ventured and invested in slave voyages and supplying slave ships with equipment and rum. The family was heavily involved with all aspects of turning molasses into rum and rum into slaves. But after all the dismissal of failure of the Sally, they stayed mostly to provisioning and outfitting ships. John Brown made considerable wealth with the business. John was the first Rhode Island merchant to break into the lucrative trade with China by sending the General Washington to Canton in 1787 and was also the treasurer of the College of Rhode Island for 21 years. When the Treaty of Paris was signed in 1763, the British enforced a mostly ignored tax on co colonial imports of sugar to pay back their war debts and manage their newly acquired property. This angers the aforementioned John Brown and his merchant friends, who were highly dependent on the trade being loosely, if at all, re regulated. They had thrived on exploiting the labor of the enslaved natives and Africans, and they intended to continue doing so. To that end, they intimidated and even kidnapped federal officials, including slicing off an ear to make a point. The slaveholders slash benefactors sent Stephen Hopkins, also the school's first chancellor, to deliver the Rhode Island Remonstrance, a protest that would decry all one needed to know about the colony's dependence on the slave trade. Hopkins likened the tax to effectively enslaving the colonies. He argued that, taught that the tax would render them, the citizens of the colony, slaves being taxed without representation. He concluded with, without this trade, it would have been and will always be utterly impossible for the inhabitants of this colony to subsist themselves or to pay for any considerable quality of British goods. The document concluded, the real message was obviously you're messing with my money. This would cause much friction between the colonies and Britain. Some would argue that the burning of the Gatsby in 1772 was a greater assault against British rule than the dumping of the tea in Boston. It is notable that Rhode Island sent its militia and resources when British troops retaliated against Boston. More sugar, more rum, more slaves. More sugar, more rum, more slaves. More sugar, more rum, more slaves. The hungry slave machine produced an appetite for wealth that consumed the hearts of many of the men who worked to feed it. They were simultaneously concerned with the concept of their own life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and seemingly patently ignorant of the enormous cost of their heinous and criminal industry. Many of the profiteers were the beneficiary, beneficiaries of Brown University, so named after Nicholas Brown, who, after inheriting his father's wealth, slave money, in 1797, became a great benefactor of the college. Nicholas was known to be an abolitionist, though any business of his father that he engaged in likely had some tie to the slave trade. Any wealth inherited was well interwoven into the tapestry of business. More sugar, more rum, more slaves. More sugar, more rum, more slaves, more rum. We can't say any longer that they didn't know that what they were doing was wrong. The brutal, cruel, and inhumane treatment of some humans for the prosperity of other humans, which is inherent in the slavery machine, leaves no room for any who were involved or those who have benefited, whether directly or indirectly, legally or illegally, from this crime against humanity to be silent and inactive. The time has come to illuminate the truth. May it be a beacon for all who seek freedom to have a conscience and who desire sincerely the removal of the mental cataracts that prevents us from seeing each other. University Hall was the first building erected and the building required labor for both the enslaved African and the native, old and the young, even one free African. The ledger carefully mentions the enslaved individuals whose labor had been donated 
in kind by many of the college's most important benefactors. There was nothing kind about it. Not only was Rhode Island instrumental in the slave trade, it was the anchor for the trade. Many people believe that slavery was a nicer, kinder, gentler thing in the, in the North. Scholars like Professor Christy Clark Pujara point out the absurdity of this idea. There can be no easy way to enslave a person and keep them in bondage their entire lives without force. And the enslaved in Rhode Island, though they were not tasked solely with the hard manual labor required in the southern cotton and tobacco fields in the southern colonies, they nonetheless had long, arduous work days in the service of their slave owners, who couldn't see them for what they really were, humans. More sugar, more rum, more graves. More sugar, more rum, no graves. More hatred, more terror, all slaves. Slave Ships by Lucille Clifton. Loaded like spoons into the belly of Jesus, where we lay for weeks, for months, in the sweat and stink of our own breathing. Jesus, why do you not protect us? Chained to the heart of the angel with their prayers we never tell and hot and red as our bloody ankles. Jesus, angel, can't these be men who vomit us out from ships? Call Jesus, angel, grace of God, onto a heathen country. Jesus, angel, ever again, can this tongue speak? Can these bones walk? Grace of God, can this sin live?